Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome. I'm going to uh, hand around a clipboard. If you would like to receive uh, emails about lectures like this one and other events taking place at Pusey House, um, please add your email. I know many of you are on this e-list already. I apologize. Uh, just hand on if you're already receiving such emails. And of course, you don't need to put your email address down. I'm going to say uh, a couple of things uh, about uh, today's lecture. First, I'm going to say why we call it the Peter Toon Memorial Lecture. Then I'll introduce the speaker and point beyond that to uh, Evensong. So, uh, Peter Toon, after whom this, these, this lecture today is named, was a Yorkshireman, uh, an Anglican priest, a theologian, and a church historian. He had close connections with Oxford. He was a librarian of Latimer House, and he was also a curate at uh, St. Ebb's Church. And he later became a tutor of Oak Hill College. And his ministry was divided between uh, this country and the United States. He was the president of the Prayer Book Society in the United States, but he eventually returned to serve as a priest in charge of a Staffordshire village church. And the lecture series that uh, happens each year, the Peter Toon Memorial Lecture, is sponsored by the Prayer Book Society with the cooperation of uh, Pusey House and St. Michael the Northgate. Peter died in 2009. He left behind about 40 books with essays and articles on a wide variety of topics. He wrote a very critical uh, book about the Oxford movement early in his ministry, which uh, uh, I engaged with in my own academic work. Um, he became much more, I think, um, he thought of himself or spoke of himself as, a, as an evangelical Catholic or a Catholic evangelical, and that balance was more and more important to him um, as the years went on. Uh, he, uh, he edited the Concise Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, the Compact Bible Dictionary, and uh, wrote on a whole variety of topics, very much in many ways focused on the importance of the historic formularies of the Church of England. 39 articles, the Book of Common Prayer, and the Ordinal. Uh, he enjoyed working with students, and he was an inspired of many vocations. And after his death in 2009, uh, his wife, Vita Toon, uh, established this series of lectures in his memory. After the lectures today, um, this is partly why we have, we have a bit of a fuller even song uh, on this occasion, and so we have a usual Pusey even song with hymns, but also with a sermon. Uh, the preacher today will be the Reverend Dr. Ben Sargent, priest in charge of Bransgore, St. Mary the Virgin, and Hinton Admiral. Did I pronounce that correctly there? Uh, yes, you did. It's, it's, it's a full, uh, yes. <coughs> yes. Thank you for coming today. <coughs> and that will be at 5.30. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Monsignor Jeffrey Steenson. It's a really a great pleasure to have you here today. I first heard uh, Monsignor Jeffrey uh, speak on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, in Prince Edward Island, of all places, <laughs> and uh, a very fascinating talk many years ago. Uh, he was a friend of, of, uh, of uh, Dr. Peter Toon, a student of Dr. Toon. Uh, he was the, also the ordinary emeritus, or he is the ordinary emeritus of the personal ordinary of the chair of St. Peter. Um, so he was a student of uh, Peter Toon here. He has a defo from uh, this university. And uh, he studied patristics here as a member of Christ Church, where he was ordained, and he was a regular visitor at Pusey House. Uh, he served uh, in three Anglican parishes in the United States, uh, very much in that prayer book tradition, um, All Saints Winwood, Good Shepherd Rosemount in Pennsylvania, and also in Fort Worth in Texas. He was from 2000 to 2007 canon to the ordinary as the Episcopal Church's 1,000th bishop was, uh, so the people were keeping track, and they knew he was the yeah. thousandth bishop. Um, and he served as um, he was the he was the bishop of the diocese of Rio Grande, based in Albuquerque, a long way away. Um, you were, I mean, you said this that during your ministry, you were very much inspired by the uh, your studies in the church fathers and their teaching about church unity, and that was part of I think your inspiration uh, to decide to be um, received into the Roman Catholic Church in two thousand and seven. And uh, you eventually became the, um, you were appointed by Pope Benedict XVI to be the first ordinary of the personal ordinary of the chair of St. Peter in 2012. Um, after serving in that role for many years, he went on to be priest scholar in residence at St. Paul's Seminary in Minnesota, 
and now assists in the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis. And you're also the Vice President of the Coming Home Network. I think I can imagine what that is. <laughs> um, he has an MA in Church History from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and Master of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School and a deep in patristic theology from the University of Oxford. Uh, and uh, it is great uh, pleasure to, oh, I should say also that you're a pilot. Yes. Oh, and you st do you still fly? Yes. Yes. So you're, you're the National Association of Priest Pilots. I didn't know that was such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to say much about your topic. We're very much looking forward to hearing you speak on this subject. And uh, I think uh, both in terms of our interest your in patristic theology, but also in um, and current in terms of engaging the contemporary life of the contemporary church. Thank you so much for your reason. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before I begin, I was just um, thinking about um, making a confession. This is the place where. I didn't commit a sin which I thought maybe I wish I would have committed. <laughs> That's a complicated confession. It's complicated, isn't it? I was, a, I was doing my graduate research. I checked out of the library here. Um, I checked out a book, <laughs> The Arians of the Fourth Century by John Henry Newman. And I, I, was, I was the, at that point, I was the curate up, up in Headington. And, um, one day I was just kind of working through the beginning of that book and I noticed the inside cover was inscribed um, to Edward Pusey from John Henry Newman. <laughs> it was on the open shelves and I thought, you know, all I have to do is tell the librarian I lost the book and I'm glad to pay for a new one. <laughs> But I gave it back. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure, I hope that book is not on the open shelves anymore. I'll I, check afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably no longer. Wow, right. I mean, I was just, I, it was just completely took me by surprise to see that. Um, that could have been a second class relic there, you know. <laughs> well, my topic is um, recovering the Archaea Agape or the ancient love of the early church. And it's about St. Basil of Caesarea's Episcopal mission. I'm very grateful um, to the principal of Pusey House and to the Prayer Book Society for the invitation to offer this year's Peter Toon <coughs> Memorial Lecture. It is a welcome opportunity to remember the many blessings that Peter and his wife Vita brought into our lives whilst I was studying here from 1979 to 1983. I had first met Peter when he was lecturing at my seminary, where he helped me to work my way through Newman's essay on the development of doctrine. And when we came to Oxford, he met our very young family at Heathrow Airport and helped us to settle into our flat in Oxford he knew the city so well, both as a graduate student and later as the librarian of Latimer House, just up the road. Back then, when it was around, I remember the often awkward relationship between Pusey House and Latimer House in those days. Maybe, maybe we don't use this language anymore, but then there were three roads the, high, the low road, the high road, and the broad road that delineated Anglicanism in those days. And those roads, those three roads, low, high, and broad, would not likely come together until after the Parousia. <laughs> maybe even longer than that. <laughs> depending on what people believed about purgatory in those days. So <coughs> Peter really left a deep impression on me because he worked to build bridges. He always worked to build bridges, and even in that very delicate time, he did. When he was a tutor 
at Oak Hill College in London, he brought to Oxford Carillos, the great archdeacon of the ecumenical patriarchate. He came to visit Oxford in January of 1980, and we had the privilege of hosting them for, um, for uh, tea. And the great archdeacon came to Oxford because, are you ready for this? He wanted to hear Billy Graham preach. <laughs> he was having a crusade here at the time. And when we met afterward, the great archdeacon opined, I haven't heard such preaching since I was at Mount Athos. <laughs> I thought that was a noteworthy moment for the ecumenical movement. <laughs> Peter was courageous about crossing bridges. When he came to the United States in 1991 to teach at Neshota House Seminary, he worked tirelessly to bring evangelicals and Anglo-Catholics together. But he was often misunderstood, and he suffered as a witness for Christian unity. He didn't fit the usual churchmanship categories. And his leadership in the prayer book society continued that aim of bringing these groups together. When I was here in Oxford working on my thesis about Basil of Ansira, the leader of the Homoousian party in the mid fourth century, I remember being struck by how his sometime colleague St. Basil of Caesarea would often speak of recovering the Archaea Agape, the ancient love of the church in his letters. This is a theme I've wanted to revisit for many years, and this seems to be a fitting memorial to Peter. The last sentence of Peter's 1979 work, The Development of Doctrine in the Church, reads, we do not need more Luthers, we need people who, seeing the divisions, also see the possibility of deeper and more practical unity with Christ. And this was St. Basil's vision. And as we shall see, Basil would express himself with an intensity that many of us remember in Peter. Perhaps one might even be forgiving, might be forgiven for thinking, of Cappadocia as the Yorkshire of late antiquity. <laughs> there are a lot of similarities. The church in the mid fourth century, especially in the Eastern provinces, was not in good shape. The Aryan factions, the Homoyans and the Anhomoyans, um, the people that said that the son is different from the father, utterly different in essence from the father, or that he is just maybe similar. Those fa that faction was actively promoted by the imperial state, and it had many seas under its control, especially Constantinople. The Orthodox themselves were badly divided, particularly between the Homoousians and the, and the Homoousians, those who supported the Nicene formula, Ipsissima Verba, and those who were struggling to understand the word homoousios in light of the older erogenous tradition. And it was St. Basil's aim to unite these two groups. He was not naive as he recognized that there were heretical impulses to be found at the fringes of both parties, Sabellians and Arians, respectively. Those that said there is only one ontological entity in God, and those who said there are three very distinct ontological entities in the Godhead. Basil believed that in essentials there was a common faith amongst the majority. The schism in Antioch, which had split the original See of St. Peter into three entities, had a deep impact on the Eastern Church. Basil would struggle to resolve this <clears throat> affront to Catholic unity, while St. Athanasius and the West 
would support the pro-Nicene Paulinians in Antioch, and the imperial state sought to impose an Arian bishop. Basil maintained that the Homoousian bishop Meletius was the legitimate bishop. And on this point, Basil was able to win over the great Athanasius. But it does not appear that he was ever successful with Damasus, the bishop of Rome. Basil's letter 70 to Pope Damasus, written in the second year of his episcopate, is a notable early witness to the primacy of the Roman see. Basil asked for his intervention to help heal the divisions in the East, invoking the example of his predecessor Dionysius of Rome a century before during the Valerian persecution. To renew Bond's characteristic of the early love and again to restore to vigor the peace of the fathers, the heavenly and saving gift of Christ, which has been dimmed by time, is for us both essential and advantageous and it will be, I well know, a pleasure to your Christ-loving spirit. But Pope Damasus remained committed to the Paulinian faction in Antioch, and he seems to have ignored Basil's appeal. It is, however, remarkable how the great Athanasius came to comprehend the young bishop's mission. In a letter to Palladius, one of Basil's priests in about the year 371, Athanasius urged him to support our beloved Bishop Basil, who is a glory to the church. Your bishop is following St. Paul's strategy in 1 Corinthians 9.22, to become weak to gain the weak. Look at the scope of his truth, his special purpose, his oikonomia, any church would pray to have such a bishop. <coughs> Athanasius helped to work out a solution to the Antioch schism. Whichever rival bishop dies first, then let the other be recognized as bishop. Unfortunately, the sectarianism continued for decades, but the fruits of Basil's work can be seen in St. Ambrose's letter to the emperor Theodosius later in the autumn of 381. Some time ago, St. Ambrose wrote, we wrote to you regarding the city of Antioch, which had two bishops, Paulinus and Meletius, who we knew were in agreement on the faith. Now, how did Ambrose know that? Probably from his correspondence with Basil. When Basil became the Metropolitan Bishop of Caesarea in 370, the church had endured several generations, several decades of divisive synods aimed at <coughs> replacing the Nicene formula with language more palatable to the Arian sympathizers. St. Basil himself had previously written against the radical Arian Eunomius in 363, and now he was engaged in theological controversy with the Arian pneumatomachoi, the spirit fighters, about the divinity of the Holy Spirit. But from the beginning of his episcopate, the sense of Catholic unity was crucial for him. Something had clearly happened in how the Arian crisis was unfolding. The divisiveness amongst the Orthodox had basically undone the church. And Basil's concerns are very different from what we see in the previous generation of Episcopal leadership. Basil's dear friend, Gregory of Nazianzus, offered a fascinating perspective in the eulogy he gave probably on the first anniversary of Basil's death. Basil's election had, not, had met with considerable opposition at home, partly because of personal jealousy toward him and his efforts to address corruption and raise the standards of the clergy, both moral and theological, 
But he did not let that stop him from looking beyond his jurisdiction. He began to contemplate the state of the wider church. It was not enough merely to lament and pray, and he knew that he must do something. And so he began a letter-writing campaign to the bishops all across the Christian world, striking those at a distance with arrows winged with ink, Gregory Nazianzen said. Gregory, who himself had no taste for church administration, admitted that Basil's leadership style had sometimes strained their friendship, but he recognized how effective it could be. Gregory says, for seeing that while tenderness leads to laxity and slackness, Severity gives rise to stubbornness and self-will, and he was able to avoid the dangers of each course by a combination of both, blending his correction with consideration and gentleness with firmness. What a wonderful lesson this is for clergy formation. And so Basil reached out to his colleagues throughout the Christian world and sought to restore relationships with both a friendly manner as well as an acute theological perspicuity. Even Gregory, however, didn't seem fully to appreciate that the focus of Basil's vision was to recover the archaia agape, the ancient love of the church. Some modern scholars have concluded from their reading of Basil's letters that he must have had quite a complicated personality. According to Gregory, his critics were already doing that. So great was his virtue, Gregory wrote, and the eminence of his fame, that many of his minor characteristics, even his physical aspects, have been assumed by others with a view to disparage. For instance, his paleness, his beard, his gait, his thoughtful and generally meditative hesitation in speaking, which in the ill-judged, inconsiderate opinion of many, took the form of melancholy. That's what they thought of Basil. Those were his priests writing about him. But we should simply let Basil speak for himself. His letters provide the fullest account that we have of a bishop's life and ministry from this time. St. Basil wrote five letters to Athanasius in the year 371. Now, you think about that, this is extraordinary. Of course, the Roman postal system was infinitely better than at least ours in the United States. I can't speak for here in Great Britain. <laughs> but, but they used to be very proud of the fact that you could post a letter um, say in Antioch in Syria, and it could get to Rome in a week. Um, you can't do that in the United States anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> he wrote five of them that year, and they're a good place to begin. The young bishop wrote to the Lion of Nicene Orthodoxy, frequently while alone I have had this thought, if the perversion of the churches appears so piteous to us, what feelings about these matters must have who has experienced the ancient tranquility and unity of the faith of the churches of the Lord? And his reference here is that Athanasius would have known a more unified church because um, he was there alive and functioning before the Arian controversy broke out and before the Council of Nicaea. Basil urged Athanasius to help resolve the schism in Antioch and to help the Bishop of Rome understand that some who marched under the banner of Nicaea were actually heretics, such as Marcellus of Ancyra, who was a Sabellian, who held that the substance and the person in the Godhead were essentially the same. Basil offered a metaphor to understand how those of a common faith had become divided. Dear Athanasius, he wrote, 
You see the situation on every side as from some lofty watchtower of your mind's contemplation. How just as at sea, when many ships are sailing together, all at once they are dashed one against the other by the violence of the waves, and there is shipwreck. Partly because of the violent stirring up of the sea by an external cause, and partly because of the confusion produced by the sailors pushing and jostling one another. The sailing metaphor is one that Basil would use often to describe what had happened to the faithful, especially in his concluding peroration on the Holy Spirit. He says, to what then shall we compare the present condition? It is like the chaos of a naval battle on a stormy sea, when one can no longer differentiate between friend and foe. This was caused by the Arian controversy, and now everyone thinks he is a theologian and can decide with whom he is in communion. So what was Basil proposing? That the bishops must work more diligently to restore those fraternal relationships and joined by the apostles, which theological controversy and ecclesiastical disorder have fractured. <coughs> it is more than nostalgia for the past. The love of many has grown cold. Concord among brothers is no more. The very name of unity is ignored. Christian compassion or sympathetic tears cannot be found anywhere. Basil, with the help of his deacons as his postal couriers, reached out to his confreres across the Christian world to make this point. There are numerous references in Basil's letters about how the ancient love of the church has grown cold. And if you'll permit me just to give you a few examples. Because he's writing to bishops all over the world here. Letter 91 to Valerian of Aquileia, that's up in northern Italy, 372. For the famine of love among us, honorable brother, is terrible, and the cause is easily seen, because iniquity has abounded, the charity of the many has grown cold. For this reason your letter is very dear to us, and we are answering you through the same messenger, our most pious fellow deacon and brother, Sabinus. By the way, just a little note here about how the bishops in the ancient world depended on their deacons. It's beautiful. I, in my work now, I, I do a lot of formation with deacons, or deacons in, in formation, or, or their post-ordination formation. And deacons the permanent deacons in the church have a very difficult road because they're just so far removed from the bishop and the priests. And what you see in these patristic bishops is a deep sense of, of appreciation for the deacon and his ministry. And I just, I just, you know, this is one of the things that I just take my hat off to these early Christian bishops, in particular Basil how he depended on these deacons and praised their help. Second one I wanted to give you was letter 92, which he wrote also in the year 372 to the bishops of Italy and Gaul. He said, in addition to the open war of the heretics, still another that has sprung up among those who seem to be orthodox has reduced the church to the lowest state of weakness. On this account, we especially need help from you in order that those professing the faith of the apostles, after putting an end to the schisms which they devised, may become subject for the future to the authority of the church, so that the body of Christ, being restored to soundness in all its members, may be made perfect, regaining, regaining the ancient glory of orthodoxy. The third example is letter 114 to Syriacus, who was probably the bishop of Tarsus. We're still early in his episcopate now, 372, so just two years in. Why should we proclaim among men 
who are the sons of peace. How great is the blessing of peace. Since therefore this blessing, great and wondrous and eagerly desired by all those who love the Lord, now runs the risk of being reduced to a bare name. Because iniquity has abounded, the charity of many having now grown cold, I think that those who serve the Lord sincerely and truly ought to have this one ambition, to bring back to unity the churches which have been severed from one another. For nothing belongs so peculiarly to a Christian as being a peacemaker. Letter 164, he wrote to Ascolius, the bishop of Thessalonica in Greece. When we took your letter into our hands and read it over and over and perceived the grace of the Spirit abounding in it, we thought we were living in the olden times when the churches of God flourished, rooted in the faith, made one in love. At that time, we Christians had peace with one another, that peace which the Lord left us, of which now there is no longer a trace remaining. So cruelly have we been driven from it one to another. So what is our condition now? Charity has grown cold. The doctrine of the fathers is being destroyed. Shipwreck in the faith is frequent. <clears throat> May God be reconciled to his churches and lead them back again to the ancient peace. In 374, he wrote letter 191 to, he addressed it to Amphilochius of Iconium, but we think it was probably addressed to Simpius, the bishop of Seleucia in Isauria, which is basically today what you'd find in southern Turkey. Now, it is the duty of your charity to give with this good, goodly beginning what comes next to organize the like-minded brethren around you and to indicate the time and place for the meeting in order that having in this way, by the grace of God, received one another, we may administer the churches according to the ancient pattern of love, admitting as our own members the groups of brethren coming from each party, sending forth as friends and welcoming them in turn as from among friends. For this was once the boast of the church, that brethren from each church, journeying from one end of the world to the other, furnished with small tokens, sumbala, found all to be fathers and brothers. These sumbala were basically like, we kind of do that today. Uh, bishops go and visit each other, and they might leave a cross or a medal or something like that. They had... They, those little gifts had a great meaning in the early church to express um, the love <coughs> and the communion that they had one with another. This now, together with everything else, the enemy of the churches of Christ has taken away from us, and we are confined in our cities and hold our neighbor in suspicion. And what else shall I say except we have let our charity grow cold, by which our Lord alone said that his disciples were to be distinguished. In letter 197, which he wrote to St. Ambrose, he says, The Lord himself transferred you from the judges of the earth to the chair of the apostles. <clears throat> if you don't know how Ambrose was called to the ministry, it's just so fascinating. He was a governor of the Roman province there, and he was elected, he was a catechumen, he was elected bishop at, um, at a synod in Milan, and in one week he went from being baptized and confirmed to being ordained deacon, priest, and bishop. It's the fastest formation program in the history of the church. <laughs> That's what, and Basil was referring to this. Um, he's been, the Lord transferred you from judges of the earth, the chair of the apostles. Fight the good fight and correct the infirmities of the people. If by chance the malady of Arian madness has seized upon anyone, renew the ancient footprints of the fathers and by the frequency of your salutations, be zealous 
to build upon the foundations of love toward us, which you have laid down. In this way, we shall always be able to be near each other in spirit, even if in our earthly dwelling we are very far apart. <clears throat> Two more examples I'll give you. Letter 203, he wrote to the bishops of the seacoast of Pontus. So he's bishop of Caesarea, um, Caesarea in modern-day Turkey, and if you go north a few hours, you get to the shore of the Black Sea. That was his territory. And he was writing to the bishops that lived along those towns on the islands and right along the seacoast there. He says, now do not let this reasoning hold you back, namely that we who dwell along the seashore are outside of the misfortune of the majority and not in want of aid from others. Therefore, what need is there for us of communion with one another? Basil says, the Lord has separated the islands from the mainland by the sea, but he has bound the islanders and the dwellers of the mainland together by charity. Nothing separates us from each other, brethren, unless we deliberately choose to consent to a separation. We, however, though we are sprung from those fathers who ordained by law that tokens of unity should be borne from one end of the world to the other through little signs, and that all should be fellow citizens and friends to all, do we now cut ourselves off from the world? And are we not even ashamed in our isolation? And the last example I wanted to give is the letter he wrote in 377 to Epiphanius, the bishop of Salamis. This is letter 258. It's very significant because Epiphanius, um, if you've ever had a chance to study him, Epiphanius is the great heresy hunter of the fourth century, the later fourth century. He wrote a book called the Panarion, which is a kind of an encyclopedia of every heresy that had ever appeared in the church up to that time. I know it well, from <laughs> four years of <laughs> painful reading. It has long been expected from the prediction of the Lord, and now finally confirmed by the test of events, that because iniquity is abounded, the charity of many would grow cold. At present, everyone is inclined to sp suspect everyone else, Nowhere is there compassion, nowhere is there sympathy, nowhere a brotherly tear for a suffering brother. No persecution for the truth, nor lamentation of the churches with their whole people, nor this long succession of difficulties surrounding us are able to stir in us solicitude for each other. But we leap upon the fallen, we irritate their <laughs> wounds, we who seem to share the same opinion, intensify the insults from the heretics. Those who are in agreement in the most vital matters are, on some one point at least, utterly at variance with one another. So I just made a list of some of the things that refer to this recovering the ancient love of the church. Now, Basil, as a bishop, embraced what we would call a principle of reserve. In Gregory of Nazianzus's panegyric on his friend, he mentions their disagreement about how a bishop ought to do theology. Basil believed it was necessary to follow the principle of reserve, or economy, for the sake of unity. Gregory had previously reported to Basil that someone had severely criticized him for failing to be more outspoken about the homoousion of the Holy Spirit in a sermon that he had preached in 371. Here is one of Basil's priests telling Gregory why he thought Basil was off the wall. I heard the great Basil speak most beautifully and perfectly upon the God and Godhead of the Father and the Son, as hardly anyone else could speak. 
but he slurred over the Holy Spirit. Gregory would then defend Basil's method. That he, no less than any other, acknowledged that the Spirit of God is plain from his often having publicly preached this truth. Whenever opportunity offered, and eagerly confessed it when questioned in private. But he made it even more clear in his conversations with me, from whom he concealed nothing during our conferences on this subject. I will set forth one point hitherto unknown to most men. Under the pressure of the difficulties of the period, Basil himself undertook the economy while allowing freedom of speech to me whom no one was likely to drag from obscurity to trial or banishment, in order that by our united efforts our gospel might be firmly established. This principle of reserve can be seen in the way that Basil argued for the divinity of the Holy Spirit. This was a hard thing for the church to come to terms with. They were just getting going with accepting that the Son is consubstantial with the Father. But they struggled with the doctrinal definition of the Holy Spirit. And Basil, in his, he used this principle of reserve in arguing for the divinity of the Holy Spirit in his seminal essay on the Holy Spirit. It's a little book, by the way, that if you want to have a good start to a patristic reading, if you've never really jumped into the Fathers, um, that little book, St. Vladimir Seminary Press publishes it, On the Holy Spirit by St. Basil the Great, is wonderful, and it's accessible to all people. Mm. He defends his use of two different forms of the doxology he used when praying with his people. There's the newer form that developed after the Council of Nicaea. Glory to the Father, with the Son, together with the Holy Spirit. And then there is the more traditional, glory to the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit. Basil would go on to explain how these two forms of the doxology can be reconciled by the way they bear witness to the imminent and economic Trinity, respectively. But it would take time to bring the faithful along to accept this new form. They will grow into the truth, Basil argued, through relationships of communion, if their bishop should have the courage and confidence to lead in this way. Basil commended this principle in letter 113 to the presbyters at Tarsus in 372. He said, there would be union if we would be willing to accommodate ourselves to the weaker in whatever matters do no harm to souls. We also ask you to receive in communion those who do not say that the Holy Spirit is a creature in order that the blasphemers may be left alone and that either being ashamed they may return to the truth or continuing in their sin may be held unworthy of credit because of their small number. Therefore, let us seek for nothing more but to hold out to the brethren who wish to be united with us the creed of Nicaea. Remember, he's writing this before the Second Ecumenical Council. So the creed, the Nicene Creed we use, that is very specific on the divinity of the Holy Spirit, hasn't been proposed yet. The, the original Nicene Creed basically comes to a full stop. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Full stop. So he says, um, if they will accept that first Nicene Creed, if they agree with it, let us require further that they must not say that the Holy Spirit is a creature, nor be in communion with those who say it, that he is. But I think we should demand nothing beyond this. Basil here is teaching that the work of Christian unity requires deliberate and ceaseless effort. Not many are willing to build up the churches 
he wrote to the presbyters of Tarsus, and so special effort must be made to unify them. Like an old coat which is always being torn and is difficult to mend, the unity of the church must never be taken for granted, but requires great diligence and courage from her leaders. Basil writes, the present time shows a great inclination toward the destruction of the churches. As to the building up of the church, the correction of errors, compassion toward the weak among the brethren, and protection for those who are sound, not one of these things exists. I think that one of the most insightful studies about Basil's churchmanship is the Canadian Paul Jonathan Fedwick's book, The Church and the Charisma of Leadership in Basil of Caesarea. The lesson that Fedwick drew from this letter 113 is that Basil believed that theological precision should be one of the fruits of Christian unity and not its precondition. The minimum and not the maximum of theological precision should be postulated in relations with and reception of people joining the church. Hedwig summed up Basil's pastoral approach in this way. Thus, though deeply preoccupied with the purity of the church's faith, Basil, instead of being a hair splitter and a perfectionist, preferred to make himself weak with the weak, 1 Corinthians 9.22, in order to be of no hindrance to those who are being saved. Now, this raises a difficult question for us, at least for me. What about the rule that has governed Catholic ecumenism, that a comprehensive agreement in doctrine and discipline must be a precondition for intercommunion? Is it possible that the standard had been set too high? Might the course of Anglicanism have been different if fellowship with the See of Peter had materially deepened during the hopeful days of Archic? It's probably now too late given the doctrinal reimagining that has changed Anglicanism. But was an opportunity missed a half century ago? At the heart of our continuing obligation to proclaim the truth of the Catholic tradition, Christian unity must remain a paramount goal. It is all too easy to lose sight of this when we become overly preoccupied with the tasks of managing and guarding our own household. Basil frequently wrote about becoming isolated from others who were outside one's own ecclesial walls. He said, I think that those who serve the Lord sincerely and truly ought to have this one ambition, to bring back to unity the churches which have been severed from each other. And what else shall I say, except that we have let our charity grow cold, by which our Lord said that his disciples were to be distinguished. Basil was saying in effect, Restore communion before it is too late. Because once divisions have sent in, set in, they inevitably widen. On the <clears throat> occasion of the 1600th anniversary of Basil's death, Pope John Paul II wrote this tribute to the great doctor of the church. It is the very truth of the gospel, in fact, that is obscured by the discord of Christians. And it is Christ himself who is lacerated by it. The division of the churches is therefore so clearly and directly opposed to Christ and to biblical teaching that according to Basil, the way to the recomposition of unity can only be the reconversion of all to Christ and his word. Now it is certainly important to note that Basil was not promoting indiscriminate communion, communion, as is being done in some quarters today. Basil's pillar of truth was sacred tradition. The 
foundation of Christian unity he maintained in On the Holy Spirit is the shared conviction that we must turn back to Holy Scripture and the Fathers of the Church. It is in looking back that we find fidelity in doctrine. It is looking forward where we have charity in practice. Father Anthony Meredith, SJ, of blessed memory, one of my teachers who taught me to love the fathers summed up Basil so well. In his whole life and policy, Basil represents the best type of ecclesiastic. And Father Anthony, may I just say to that, Amen. Thank you so much.